Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. My name is Brent Cunningham. I'm your facilitator today, and I'll be monitoring any questions and comments you have in the background. Um, we'll also have a Q&A session in the end. With that, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Greg Mihos. Greg is the director of Greg Mihos and Associates. Uh, he's also a chemical engineering consultant who specializes in bulk solids handling, storage and processing, and an adjunct professor at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, he enjoys teaching professionals and students bulk solids, engineering fundamentals so that they can solve powder handling problems and design equipment for reliable handling of solids. And with that, Greg, uh, thank you again for joining us today. If you are ready, I'll pass the ball to you and you can start your presentation. I am ready, although I have a little bit of laryngitis, I'll try to get through, but I'm gonna be talking today about flow and storage of powders. So this is a subject that's used quite a bit or noted quite a bit by pe uh, people in civil engineering because they are always worried about particles not flowing. They're building structures on top of particles which they do not want to move. The mechanical engineers, they tend to take the right courses. They take trigonometry and calculus. They also take uh, statics and, and dynamics and properties of materials. But if you're a chemical engineer like me, you kind of come up with at least a volumes based on the bulk density. You'll choose a hopper angle that's pleasing to the eyes. You'll choose an outlet that's gonna match the valve that some vendor recommended. And hopefully your next project is going to involve a liquid because at least you know how to handle, calculate a Reynolds number. And I always jokingly say that whenever I visit a plant, it's often easy to identify the equipment that has powders because they're the ones with all the hammer marks. So my goals for today are to help you understand the fundamental powder flow property so you can predict powder flow behavior and know how to design or modify equipment for reliable powder handling. One more goal, I do a lot of seminars. And in fact, a few years ago, I gave a workshop at an event called the Chem Show. It was held in New York City. And two years later, the Chem Show's website featured me on their webpage that discussed seminars. And I thought, well, I must be pretty good until I noticed this guy. So my other goal is to make sure that you stay, pay attention for the next hour. So quick definitions, bulk solid powder. I tend to use these terms interchangeably. Bulk solid is just about anything. You're talking about maybe sawdust or biomass or lumps of coal or even candy. Powder tends to be finer material, fi finer particles. I work quite a bit with biomass. Does anybody recognize this? Well, let's just say that whenever I tell people that I'm a chemical engineer, that's that specializes in bulk solids handling and processing. They don't get too excited, but if I mention that I'm a co-inventor of a patented process for removing THC from marijuana, then they want to know more. Even though I've never touched the product or even the starting material, for me, it was just a very entertaining, unique powder handling project. More definitions, geometry is important. When we talk about geometry, we're talking about either axially symmetric or planar, so axially symmetric, we're going to converge into either a round outlet or a square outlet versus planar where we have flat walls and an elongated outlet. The terms hopper, bin, or silo, they tend to be used interchangeably. Hoppers and bins tend to be smaller, silos tend to be really large, but the geometry is very, very important. Stress, normal stress is stress normal to a plane. Shear stress is parallel to a plane. And there's this odd stress called the major principal stress. It turns out that with powders, the stress that you measure is going to depend on what plane you are looking at. But let me state the obvious. Liquids and solids, they behave differently. Liquids are frictionless. That's why if you pour a liquid onto a flat surface, it's going to flatten out. Whereas solids, they're going to form a pile because they have internal friction. Compressibility, liquids are nearly incompressible. Solids, they tend to be compressible. And there's this odd term called isotropy, which tells you whether or not the property of a material depends on the direction. So for example, if I were to measure the pressure of a liquid, no matter where I direct my probe, I'm gonna get the same pressure. 
versus solids, they turn out to be anisotropic. The pressure that I measure is going to depend on what direction I stick the probe. But liquids, they've been studied for quite a while, and they're well classified. Here's a chart. They can be Newtonian or viscoelastic. Real pectic or thixotropic tells you whether or not the viscosity changes over time. And pseudoplastic dilatant, that tells you whether or not the material is shear thinning or shear thickening. And I looked for a similar chart and classification for powders, and I found a good one. Powders are neurotic, sadistic, masochistic, or schizophrenic. They have some odd behaviors. They have poor flow, or they can be abrasive, or they can degrade, or they can suck up moisture or accumulate an electric charge. They have some unique problems that you don't necessarily see with liquids. For example, rat holing. I'm sure you've seen rat holes. That occurs when the hopper walls aren't steep enough and they have high friction. And so you only get flow in the center right above the outlet. And if you have a axis symmetric geometry, the flow channel can be very, very small. You'll have only discharging right above the outlet and you'll have a lot of material accumulating inside the hopper. Or you might have arching or bridging. So arching can occur either if the material is so cohesive, the arch that forms at the outlet is so strong it's going to support its own weight. Or if you have an odd material with an odd aspect ratio, you might have mechanical interlocking. So sometimes you'll see bridging in a hopper. In Boston, a couple of years ago, we had a bridge, it had a hopper and a bridge. Caking can be a nuisance. You might have a free-flowing material and everything's fine. But then when your customer gets it, he or she opens up the bag and what used to be a 50 pound bag of powder is now a 50 pound brick. Or it might occur in the process. Everything is working fine, but then you leave material at rest over a weekend, say, you open up the valve and nothing comes out. You look inside and you have lots and lots of lumps that prevent material from flowing, discharging from the hopper. Flooding can occur if you have gas effects and you might have gas in it because, for example, a collapsing rat hole, once you have fluidized material, just the fact that it's fluidized, that implies it's more liquid-like. And feeders often rely on internal friction. If you have something fluidized, you don't have any friction. So you might stop the screw, but yet everything will continue to discharge. You may empty the entire contents of your hopper, even though you stopped the feeder. Segregation can occur. For example, if you have a difference in particle sizes and your material is free flowing, then you drop everything into a hopper. And once you start to form a pile, even though it may have initially been well uniformly distributed, you get side to side separation by particle size. So very quickly what's happening is once you form a pile, the larger particles tend to be more free flowing. They'll roll towards the periphery, towards the walls, and the fine particles will percolate down the center. And now if you had that size, uh, size separation by particle size, you can get what's called sifting segregation or what my friend Lynn Bates calls Christmas tree segregation. Sometimes you might have a limiting discharge rate. The analogy I like to use is when you have a water cooler, you know what happens, you know, open up the faucet and everything comes out, but before too long, you start getting some glug glug flow behavior because of course you're increasing the volume of gas above the liquid. And as you increase the volume, the pressure goes down, you have vacuum. And so now you have an adverse pressure gradient. You'll have gas flowing counter current to the liquid. And the same thing can actually happen in a pow with a powder in a hopper, even if the hopper is vented. Because if it's a fine powder, the powder itself will form a seal. And actually what happens is the powder has to dilate to be able to pass towards the outlet. That is, the particles have to separate from each other to be able to move. So now the particles are separated, the void volume gets greater, the volume gets greater, the pressure gets lower, and now you have a negative pressure gradient and you get that glug, glug, glug flow behavior. So whether or not you have a flow problem often depends on the type of solids flow pattern that you have. And there's two types of flow patterns, funnel flow and mass flow. So in funnel flow, you only have flow in the center. And if you have a actually symmetric geometry, that flow channel will be very, very narrow. You only have flow in the center. And you can see that you'll have potential problems. You've had the side to side separation by particle size. The material in the middle will be different from the material on the sides. If your material is prone to caking, you have stagnant materials so or more likely to have caking. You won't necessarily have first in, first out. You can have potential problems. 
Funnel flow is not necessarily a problem unless the, as long as the rattles collapse, but if you have a cohesive material, then you only have a small fraction of the contents of your hopper discharge when you open up the feeder, the valve or start the feeder. So what you generally want to have is what's called mass flow. Mass flow occurs when the hopper walls are steep enough and low enough in friction, so you get flow everywhere. So now you get first in, first out. You can see that's much more behaved. You're able to mitigate the side and size separation by particle size because everything's being remixed at the outlet. You're less likely to get caking because everything's in motion. And you can see that the discharge rate is much more regular. In fact, you can predict the discharge rate. So if you take a survey of the world, you'll find mass flow hoppers and they are characterized by very steep cones. Turns out that planar geometries are much more amenable to mass flow. Funnel flow, you can often identify funnel flow hoppers by all the hammer marks from the operators trying to collapse the rat holes. Turns out pyramids are really bad because the valleys are not very steep. So how do you prevent flow problems? Let me state the obvious. You want to make sure that the outlet is properly sized. You want to make sure the outlet is large enough to prevent an obstruction to flow. And more often than not, you want to design or modify your, your hopper to allow mass flow, but you need the powder flow properties. So how do you define flowability? Some people use angle repose, car and housing ratios, flow energy, a Flodex or a Hall flow meter, which measures the discharge rate through an orifice, something called FFC, which is a ratio of the stress to the strength. And all these metrics have one thing in common. None of them predict flow behavior. So how do you define flowability? Well, I always say that if you want to define material that has good flowability, it has good flowability if it actually flows. If you open up the feeder or the gate, everything discharges. Versus poor flowability, now you open up the gate to start the valve and nothing moves. That's poor flowability. So my point is you might have a material that has the right flow index, the right car index or whatever, but if you have the wrong equipment, you're gonna have poor flowability. So when you talk about flowability, not only do you have to talk about the powder, you have to talk about the equipment. So this goes back to fundamental properties. If you know the fundamentals, you can actually predict flow behavior. You can determine ahead of time if the powder will reliably flow from a bin or hopper, and if the walls are steep enough to prevent rat holes from forming, and if the solids discharge rate will be high enough for your downstream process. Or once you know the fundamentals, you can design equipment for a reliable flow. You can calculate the minimum outlet dimension that's required to prevent an obstruction to flow. You can calculate the recommended mass flow hopper angle, and you can determine the outlet dimension that's that's needed to achieve the desired discharge rate. So what are the fundamental properties? For liquids, everything has an analogy to liquids. For liquids, we know what to do. We, will, we don't even have to measure it ourselves more times than not. We can just look it up. We'll need the viscosity, the density. If we are worried about cavitation, for example, we might need to calculate or look up the vapor pressure. But once we have the viscosity, the density, for example, once we have the line size and the throughput, we can calculate a Reynolds number. Once we have the Reynolds number, we can calculate a delta P. Once we have the delta P, we can come up with the HP, and we're well on our way to designing a system for liquids. The analogous set of fundamental properties for powders are as follows. Cohesive strength, internal friction, compressibility, wall friction, and permeability. If you know these fundamental properties, you should be able to predict flow and design equipment for reliable flow. So where do you get these properties? Before I tell you, let me take a break and just tell you a great story about Andrew Jenicky. He is a pioneer. He's a person who figured this all out. He came up with the fundamental equations, the theories, the analysis, the test methods, and determined in how to predict flow behavior and to design equipment for reliable flow. He's got a great professional history. He's got a great personal story as well. Andrew Jenicky, he was born in Poland. He graduated from a school in Warsaw with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. He immediately joined the Polish military just before World War II started. He fought against the Nazis, both in the military and in the underground. Eventually he escaped to England. While he's in England, he continued his studies. He received a doctorate degree in structural engineering. Eventually he immigrated to Canada and then the United States. And he was, he ended up in Salt Lake City, Utah. 
And he was a bookworm. He used to like to go to the University of Utah Library after hours to check out the library and check out the literature. And he was surprised to find out that there really wasn't a whole lot of fundamental understanding behind powder flow and silo design. Everything was pretty much based on rules of thumb or whatever made the math easier, the fabrication easy. Engineers were really nerdy back then, not that things are different now, but they all had triangles and triangles were 30 degrees, 45 degrees or 60 degrees. So guess what? All the hoppers were 30 degrees, 45 degrees or 60 degrees. 30 degrees in vertical is a popular choice because the sine of 30 degrees was equal to one half. That made the math easy. So he approached the National Science Foundation and said, there's got to be a better way to do it. And this is an area worth funding. And the NSF said, yeah, we agree with you, but we cannot fund you because you're not a professor. So he wandered back on to the University of Utah campus and talked to the civil engineering department with a proposal. Said, hire me as a professor. You don't have to pay me. I had the funding. Just give me a lab and some students. So he figured it all out. The flow property test measurements, the theories, the fundamental theories. He tested his theories with experiments. And again, it was, it was cohesive strength, internal friction, compressibility, wall friction, permeability. Eventually, he left the University of Utah and started his own consulting firm along with one of his graduate students named Jerry Johansson. They founded Jer Jenneke and Johansson. And man, I'm so lucky to have worked for Jenneke and Johansson because that's where I got my education. That's where I got my training on, on powders. Some people say that's where I was brainwashed. But again, it really is the only game in town. Jenny King Johansson is really good. And again, cohesive strength, internal friction, compressibility, wall friction, permeability are the key properties. So where do you get these properties? You can't look them up. This is, a, according to my wife, this is proof that I have no life because I own all nine editions of Perry's Chemical Engineers. And I will tell you that there's no data in ninth edition because I wrote this section on hopper design and powder testing. You won't find any data there because think of it. Something as simple as the bulk density is going to depend on the material. It will depend on the particle size. Reba can help you out there. It depends on the particle shape. It can depend on the stress. So some, the porosity of the particle. So something as simple as the bulk density is gonna depend on the material that you're handling. So there's no substitute to testing the material that you are handling. How do you test material? There are two devices you wanna have in your lab, shear cell testers and permeability testers. Shear cell testers measure almost everything you need. Cohesive strength, internal friction, compressibility or bulk density, bulk friction. And of course, permeability testers measure permeability. These are the common shear cell testers that are out there. The Jenneke tester is still used by Jenneke and, and Johansson. When I worked at Jenneke and Johansson, J and J used to sell both the Jenneke tester and the Chelsea tester, and people call me and say, "Which tester should I purchase, the Jenneke tester or the Chelsea tester?" And I'd say, "Depends on what kind of health insurance do you have." So, what do you mean? I said, "Well, if you get a Jenneke tester." you'll need to make sure you have good health insurance because it's gonna drive you crazy trying to get everything to work and get useful data. But if you have a Schultz test or any other testers, as a matter of fact, they're all computer operated, you kind of have infinite time to accomplish everything. So the Schultz tester is really, really good. The others is good as well. The Anton Parr tester has the advantage of being able to test materials at really, really high temperatures. The Freeman technology tester is kind of an oddball because they love to be able to measure these dynamic properties. I rather measure the fundamental properties. It doesn't quite measure the fundamental properties correctly at low, at low cohesive strength, but you don't really care because if it's free flowing, you don't really care if you measure the wrong strength. But in any event, I still like the Schultz tester the most. So let's talk about some of the properties. Compressibility. Everybody has an understanding of compressibility and the analogy you like to use is snow. If you have freshly fallen snow, you step on it, it's gonna deform because it's compressible. Whereas if you have snow that's iced up, it's gonna be incompressible. It's gonna have poor compressibility and low compressibility, incompressible. Compressibility is easily measured. You take a sample, you place it in a cell, you place a lid on the cell and then you apply a normal load. 
Once you apply the load, the volume is going to change. You know what the mass is. The bulk density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. And so you keep track of the bulk density as a function of the consolidation pressure. And you get what's often called the compressibility curve. And shown here is something typical. You get high compressibility at low stresses. And it becomes eventually rather incompressible at high stresses. Let's talk about wall friction. A good analogy is a dump truck. You know how they work. You take a material, you place it in the dump truck, you get to the site, and then you lift one in, you tilt it, and first nothing comes out, you have to overcome wall friction first. Eventually, once the truck is tilted enough, it starts to slide. And then what I actually want to do is I want to go in the other direction. I want to reverse the direction of the tilt until it stops flowing. And now I can perform a force balance. I have the force due to gravity downward. I have the force due to friction, which I will define as a friction coefficient mu times a normal force. I need to throw in the trigonometry to get the right components of the vectors. And after some simplification, I will find that the friction coefficient mu is equal to the tangent of the angle of incline of the truck. So that makes sense. If you have something that's high friction, it's going to require a steep angle to get it to move and get it to stop moving again. What we do for powders is we use a shear cell tester in a mode that allows us to measure the wall friction. We take a sample of powder, we place it on top of, of a coupon of wall material, we apply normal force, and then we measure the force required to push the material, slide the material along the wall coupon for a range of normal forces. We plot the normal load against the shear stress and we are able to generate what's called the wall yield locus. Then we can take a point, a draw line from the origin to a point on the wall yield locus and the angle it's formed is what we call the angle of wall friction. Now, the angle of wall friction, you know that the tangent of the angle of wall friction phi prime is equal to the opposite over the adjacent, which is the shear stress divi divided by the normal stress, which is equal to the friction coefficient. So you see that the friction coefficient and the wall friction angle are related, one's a tangent of the other. So why are we going to use an angle of wall friction rather than friction coefficient? When Jenneke and others derived all the equations, it, there were angles all over the place. It sure was a lot easier to work with angles of wall friction rather than inverse tangents of friction coefficients. But all you need to know is the greater the friction coefficient, the greater the wall friction angle, the higher the friction you have. Now, once you've measured the wall friction, you can gain some insight. So say you've measured the wall friction on two different surfaces. So one yield locus is denoted in green, the other yield locus is denoted in red. Now, if you want to have mass flow flow on the wall, uh, flow along the walls, you would anticipate that the material that gave you the yield locus shown in green is probably the wall material that you want to select. It has a lower wall friction angle. In fact, this is where Jenneke was a freaking genius. He figured it all out. He derived all these equations that describe the stress, the magnitude of stress and the direction of stress, and tried to solve them. And the equations were really complicated. They were split boundary conditions, so he had to integrate these equations by hand. This is before computers. This is the 1960s. And he was a bit frustrated because sometimes he could get a solution, sometimes he couldn't. But then eventually it dawned on him that whenever he couldn't get a, a solution, he could not satisfy the boundary condition that described flow along the walls. In other words, whenever he selected a friction coefficient or wall friction angle that was high, and a hopper angle that was shallow, he could not get flow along the walls. On the other hand, if he selected a wall friction angle that was small and a hopper angle that was steep, he was able to get a solution. He was able to therefore theor theoretically come up with mass flow boundary conditions that were a function of delta, which is an internal friction, effective angle of, of friction. Remember I told you that internal friction is one of the properties. Delta is the effective angle of friction. That comes out of a shear cell test as well. So, for example, if I were to measure the wall friction angle at the outlet equal to, say, 23 degrees, 
the theoretical boundary would be say 23 degrees, but I would want to give myself a safety factor and I specify a hopper angle of say 20 degrees. And that's going to be a hopper that will allow mass flow for this particular combination of bulk material and wall material. He also solved the equations for planar flow. Again, 20 degrees, you would recommend a 20 degree from vertical hopper angle. He also presented recommended hopper angles for mass flow. And these are recommended. The mass flow, theoretical mass flow boundaries are almost off the chart. It's really hard to get funnel flow or rat hole in a planar geometry. So these are theoretical. You can actually go past the boundary. So again, same wall friction angle, but instead of 20 degrees, you can go say 40 degrees, even higher, because you're able to get mass flow at a much less steep hopper angle. By the way, there are a lot of 30 degree hoppers out there, 30 degrees by from vertical. And you know why? It's because they're cheap to make. If I were in the hopper business, this is what I want to sell you, a 30 degree hopper. Because all I have to do is take a square sheet of sheet metal. I'll cut a couple of circles. I'll cut them in two. I will fold up the, and weld the edges, and I'll end up with a 30 degree from vertical hopper. And you'll see that there is very, very little waste material. This is going to be good for my bottom line. Now, on the other hand, if I were asked to provide a hopper that's 20 degrees from vertical, I might be a little annoyed because now, Instead of a couple of semicircles, I have to make a Pac-Man like member. Now I will fold it. I'll get a 20 degree hopper. It's going to be good for flow, but it's not going to be good for my bottom line. See all the waste material there for the 20 degree hopper versus the 30 degree hopper. I'd rather sell you the one on the left because I might be able to sell you a hammer as well. One warning about valley angles. Pyramidal hoppers. I look at pyramidal hoppers as crappy cones. You think that I might have steep walls and it might be steep enough for mass flow. You know, it's not planar because there's planar flow. I need to have a slotted outlet. I have a square outlet, so it's going to be actually symmetric. And those hopper walls might appear to be uh, steep, but the valleys are a lot more shallow. So if you ever notice in your rooftops, depending on where you live, if you have snow, the snow will slide on the steep sloping roof but at the spots where the roof sections intersect, the valleys are rather shallow and nothing will slide off. So let's do some more, let's have some more fun. Let's look at the classic problem of determining the pressure distribution inside a cylinder of a hopper silo. So we start off with a force balance. This might be nostalgic, but I'll go kind of slowly. It's a force balance, so we'll start off with sigma v, which is the stress in the vertical direction. It's the stress I need to multiply by an area, so the area is going to be equal to pi d squared divided by 4. I will also have the force due to wall friction. I will define a friction coefficient mu. I'll multiply the, by a horizontal stress. Remember I said that powders are anisotropic, so the horizontal stress is not going to be equal to the vertical stress. And I'll need to multiply by an area, so that's going to be equal to the perimeter times the slice of the section. That's going to be equal to the force from the powder above, plus the force due to gravity, which is going to be equal to the bulk density times G, times the volume, which is going to be equal to pi d squared over 4 times dh. Now I have the beginnings of one equation, two unknowns, but I have two unknowns, the vertical stress and the horizontal stress. But this guy named Jansen back in the 1800s, he was concerned about structural integrity of corn silos. So he performed some actual measurements of stresses inside silos. And he was happy to learn that the ratio of the horizontal stress to the vertical stress was fairly constant, typically in the 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 range. So we define a stress ratio that Jansen coefficient as k as the ratio of the horizontal stress to the vertical stress and we substitute k times sigma v for sigma h and with some simplification we end up with a first order linear differential equation and everybody knows how to solve a first order linear differential equation 
first step is to go to Wikipedia and learn how to calculate an integrating factor again. And then you get the familiar form of what's called the Janssen equation. The vertical stress is equal to bulk density times G times D over four for a cylinder. D over four is equal to the hydraulic radius, the perimeter, the area divided by the perimeter, divided by the Janssen coefficient, roughly 0 0.4 for a cylinder, divided by the friction coefficient, mu, times this familiar term that comes out of a first order differential equation that has an exponential in there. So if we were to plug in some numbers, this is the stress behavior inside a cylinder. And it's unique compared to liquids. Of course, with liquids, if we were to calculate the stress, we would calculate the hydrostatic pressure. We know that the vertical stress is equal to the density times G times the depth. Whereas for powders, we have the Janssen equation. We see a couple of things. First of all, the maximum stress is a lot less for a powder than for a liquid because we have wall friction supporting the load. We also notice that eventually the stress becomes independent of the depth. We will also notice that instead of proportional to the height, it's proportional to the diameter. So that's why if you go past a plant that handles liquids and gases, it's often easy to identify which vessels, storage vessels, handle liquids and which ones handle powders. The ones that handle liquids, they're, diff they're typically tanks that are short and squatty because if you want to minimize the stress, you make them as short and squatty as possible. Whereas for powders, they tend to be very tall and narrow because if you want to minimize the stress, you try to make the diameter is reasonably small. You can also calculate the pressure distribution in the, in the hopper section. And we can perform a similar balance. And during the initial fill, it's kind of Janssen-esque at the bottom. You get a little bit of reduction of stress towards the outlet. But look what happens after discharge during mass flow. You get this peak stress right at the hopper cylinder intersection. And that's because when you get to the hopper section. Now, the powder starts to not compress, but expand radially and increases the stress. But then as everything starts to flow, again, everything has to dilate to be able to move past itself. And so the internal stress becomes less and less as you get close to the outlet. You start to develop a radial stress profile. And this is a good feature because we want to make sure that you have enough stress on the material to overcome the cohesive strength. Assuming that the cohesive strength depends on the stress, it's nice to have low stress at the outlet. Okay, another reason you might want to measure the wall friction, and that's often you want to have a transfer shoot or a diverter valve. So diverter valves are straightforward. You can get different sizes, you can get different angles. And usually you want to have a, say, a rather shallow angle because that way, you require less height, you're able to get the downstairs equipment closer together. Whereas if it's a steep angle, then those pant legs have to be longer to be able to have enough room, enough space between the equipment downstairs. So the question is, how can I calculate what angle I need to make sure I have flow? So it's straightforward, kind of like what I did before with the dump truck, but this time I'm gonna let everything accelerate. I have acceleration is equal to the sum of forces. I have a contribution due to gravity, and I have a contribution due to the wall friction. This time I'll define the wall friction coefficient as the tangent of the friction angle. I'll throw in some trigonometry to get the right components of the vectors. And after some rearrangement by inspection, I noticed that provided that the angle theta, the shoot angle reference from horizontal, as long as that's greater than the friction angle, I'm gonna have flow acceleration will be positive. It's okay if um, the friction angle is greater than the angle theta, but I will have to have a very short shoot. And it's just a matter of the next integrating the equation to figure out the velocity. I wanna make sure that the velocity never equals zero. So I'm always looking for other practical uses for the fundamentals. And I'm from Colorado, and I, used, I grew, up, grew up on skis. And then years later, I noticed that everybody's snowboarding. And I said, wow, this looks like fun. I got to try this out. So my uh, nephew took me snowboarding, and this picture is rare. 
Here's a picture of me on a snowboard, actually upright. But I kept on falling. I kept on making a complete fool of myself. It was so sad. My nephew said, come on, Uncle Greg, you told me when you were in college, you used to skateboard all the time. Why is snowboarding any different? So when we got home, I showed him the transfer shoot equation. I said, see, Gabriel, there are two terms here. One is related to the slope, one's related to friction. When I was on a skateboard, the slope was rather shallow, the friction was rather high, so the acceleration is rather manageable. However, when I'm on a snowboard, the friction is much lower, the slope is much greater, and therefore the acceleration is really high, and the only time the acceleration is high is what is when I fall, and that's because the friction between my apps on the snow is much greater than the friction between the snowboard on snow. In any event, I don't know how to snowboard, but my nephew knows how to design transfer shoes. So let's move on, more analogies to snow. A good analogy is a snowball. So everybody who's handled a snowball knows the drill. If you pack a snowball, tie a leaf, if you apply a high pre-consolidation pressure to the snowball, it's gonna have a lot of strength. On the other hand, if you apply just a light load, you might not have any strength at all. So the point is, the cohesive strength is going to depend on the consolidation pressure. So again, we use a shear cell tester to measure the cohesive strength. So this is the first step of several. We measure, we apply a normal load, and then we shear the powder until we get a constant shear stress. Now, once we're at steady state, we're actually measuring internal friction. We have the shear st stress, we have the normal stress. But now we've pre-consolidated. We remove the load, we apply a lighter load, and now we're going to try to get everything to move again. But first, nothing's going to flow because we pre-consolidated. Everything's stuck together. We packed that snowball. And so we're going to keep on pushing and pushing, and finally it's going to move. We're going to get incipient flow. It's going to yield. And so we record that value. And we do this a number of times over a range of consolidation pressures. And we're able to generate what's called the flow function, which is the relationship between the consolidation stress and the cohesive strength. So typically, we'll see an arrangement like this. At higher strength, higher stress, we get high strength. At low stress, we get lower stress, strength. So again, if we've measured the wall friction, we've measured the bulk density, we're able to calculate what the stress profile is inside our bin or hopper. And if we've measured the cohesive strength, we know the relationship between the stress and the strength. So now we can plot the cohesive strength on the same graph. I know what the cohesive strength profile is inside our bin. Now, one more concept. We call it the arch supporting stress. Arches are very, very stable. That's why a lot of old bridges are arch shaped and we started off with a force balance again and if we had a nice uniform round arch the stress on the abutment of an arch would be equal to the bulk density times g times the span which is a dia diameter for a cone divided by two it's actually approximate what jenicky did is he realized that this stress on the arch was a little bit higher how much higher depended on the the hopper angle theta prime. So we came up with some relationships, empirical relationships, they call the shape factor H of theta prime, which is approximately two, two plus change for a cone, one plus change for a planar hopper with a slotted outlet. So again, once we have measured the stress profile, we know what the cohesive strength profile is inside our hopper. And we see that the R supporting stress is proportional to the span of the hopper and the bulk density. So we can plot the R supporting stress on the same graph as the cohesive strength profile. Now we'll see that we have two scenarios. Up here, the diameter is large enough such that the stress is greater than the cohesive strength. And that means that the diameter is large enough to allow the stress to be greater than the cohesive strength, and the arch is going to fail. Whereas if the strength, if the diameter is too small, then the strength is greater than the stress. That means there's not enough stress on the hopper outlet, and you will not be able to collapse the arch. The arch will remain stable. You will not have any flow. So there is a stress where the strength is equal to the stress. We call that the critical stress. 
Now all we need to do is look at the arch supporting stress equation. We'll substitute the critical stress for the arch stress to a little arrangement, and we'll see that the minimum outlet dimension to prevent an arch from forming that's stable is equal to the shape factor H, roughly two for a cone, roughly one for a slot, times the critical stress divided by the bulk density times G. Really nice, simple, elegant equations. Really, really cool because it matches your intuition. You know that if you have a powder that's cohesive, you probably need a large outlet. And so sure enough, this critical outlet is in the denominator of this equation. What's more subtle but makes sense on when you study it more closely, if you have a material that has a high bulk density and we want gravity flow, it seems like we, if we have a powder that has a high bulk density, we want gravity flow, something that's heavy is gonna be very, very helpful for flow. So sure enough, the bulk density term is in the denominator. Again, very, very simple. And Jenke actually made it very, very simple because he came up with a concept called the flow factor. Again, the flow function is the relationship between the cohesive strength and the consolidation stress, whereas the flow factor is the ratio of the consolidation stress to the arch supporting stress. He knows that the stress profile is rather complicated to calculate. It. The arch stress is rather easy to calculate, but they both these equations had similar terms, they had the same terms, namely the span and the outlet size. So he came up with a dimensionless group called the flow factor, the ratio of the consolidation stress to the arch stress, and came up with solutions in graph form. So Jenicky presented them. Johansson has a simpler form. This is a nice equate, nice relationship, a little bit simpler because you don't need to know what the hopper angle, the wall friction angle is. It just depends on the effective angle of friction, which again you can get from a a cohesive strength test from a shear cell test. So now if you know the effective angle of friction, you can calculate what the flow factor is. So again, flow factor is a relationship between the cohesive strength and the consolidation stress. The flow factor is the relationship between the arch supporting stress and the consolidation stress. Now if we plot the flow factor and the flow function together on the same graph, we see we have two scenarios. If the flow factor is above the flow function, that means that the stress on the material at the hopper outlet is greater than the cohesive strength, which means the outlet's gonna be large enough to prevent a stable arch from forming. On the other hand, if the flow factor is below the flow function, that means the arch supporting stress is less than the cohesive strength. We're not gonna have enough stress on the outlet to cause that out, the arch to fail. And so the diameter is gonna be too small. So just like before, we can calculate the critical stress, but this time we didn't need to calculate the stress profile, which is a rather cumbersome. We get that from the flow factor. And just like before, the outlet dimension required to prevent a arch from being stable is equal to the shape factor, roughly two for a cone, one for a slotted outlet equal to the critical stress, which we're able to get from the intersection of the flow factor and flow function divided by the bulk density times G. So let me give you an example. This is a, an assignment I gave my Rhode Island students. They were asked to design a hopper that could reliably handle a blend of acetaminophen and a couple of fillers. So with a shear cell tester, they were able to come up with the flow function with the wall friction uh, yield the wall yield locus, the compressibility curve, and the internal friction as well. So this is the last of a uh, iterative procedure. They calculate the wall friction angle at the outlet, 30 degrees. And from the wall friction boundary chart, they're able to calculate what the recommended mass flow hopper angle is given a safety factor, nine degrees. Okay, that's going to be ugly, but it is what it is. And actually, that's not too atypical for conical hoppers, unfortunately. We know what the effective angle of friction is, so we're able to calculate the flow factor. From the flow factor, together with the flow function, we're able to calculate the critical stress. Plugging the critical stress into the B-min equation, we get one ugly hopper. We need a hopper that's nine degrees from vertical, 
a one foot diameter outlet. Not very practical, but there's always more than one answer. So remember I said that planar geometries, they tend to be more forgiving. Instead of a nine degree hopper angle, I can get away with say a 25 degree hopper angle from vertical. And I can get away with a smaller outlet size instead of 11 inches, it's six inches. And that has to do with that H of theta prime factor. Remember it's roughly two or one, depending on the geometry. So it turns out for planar hoppers with a slotted outlet, the required outlet dimension to prevent large in a slot is about one half that required for a the diameter of a conical hopper to prevent large. But if you're in the pharma business, what you do is you add a flow aid and you can add fume silica and mag stearate. Fume silica acts as a free flow agent, mag stearate acts as a lubricant. So shown here is the original flow function shown in red, but if we add some fume silica and max you can see that we reduce the flow function. We're able to rather dramatically reduce the cohesive strength. And the max acts as a lubricant. So you can see the wall view loci, the locus shown in green is the data where we included the lubricant. You can see that the wall friction angle is much lower. So you add fume silica, and the way fume silica works is it acts as a parting agent. The cohesive strength depends on the sum of the forces. The forces magnitude depends on the contact area and the distance between the particles. So if you add some small nano-sized particles like fume silica, you're able to increase the distance between the particles. You have less contact area. The distance is greater, so you're able to greatly reduce the cohesive strength. And I should also mention that I use Cabasil as a shameless plug for my old employer, Cabot. So I want you to use Cabasil because I still own Cabot stock, and so please buy Cabasil for a flow agent. So now if I go through the same procedure, now if I have fume silica and mag stearate, you see that my hopper angle instead of 9 degrees is 36 degrees from vertical. So that's much more practical. I can get that 30 degree hopper off the shelf that's really cheap to make and it's worked just fine. Instead of a one foot outlet, I have a one inch outlet because you got to remember in pharma, they always want to have small equipment. So, quick story about funnel flow bins. Sometimes funnel flow is preferred because you can get it with more volume in a, low, in a smaller height. And same idea, you have the major principal stress. Once you know the major principal stress, now you can calculate the cohesive strength profile, but you don't have the stress reduction. And so the strength remains high. Jenneke came up with a concept called the flow channel stress, which is equal to the bulk density times the diameter of the outlet divided by a function G, which depends on the another friction angle. And now it's a matter of making sure that the rattle collapses. You can see that upstairs, the stress on the rat hole is greater than the strength, and therefore it's going to collapse. But downstairs, the cohesive strength is greater than the, the stress on the rat hole, and therefore the rat hole is going to be Stable. So, how do you make sure that you destabilize the rat hole everywhere? Well, you figure out what the maximum strength is, which is going to be where the bottom of the cylinder meets the conical section. You can calculate that from the Janssen equation. And now it's just a matter of plugging in the strength associated with that stress. And you'll see that more often than not, you'll get a very, very large outlet size required to, to stop, to prevent a stable rat hole from forming. So very quickly here, this illustrates why you often want to have mass flow. You might have the same material, but different types of flow patterns. If you have mass flow, recall that the outlet size required to prevent an arch from being stable is equal to approximately two for a cone times its critical stress, which is really low by, by the bulk density. Whereas to prevent a stable rat hole from forming, is going to be equal to G, which is approximately four for a typical rat hole, times the strength at the bottom of the cylinder, which can be really, really high. So you can see that you get for the same material, it might be really, really to handle if you have mass flow, but challenging to handle if you have funnel flow. So sometimes people are tempted to use vibrators because they figure all I need to do is add some external stress to my hopper. If I do that, then I'll be able to break the to stop the obstruction. Shown here is a really good paper. There's a really good paper by Eli Lilly, and they show the results in chart form. Shown here is a table. The 
columns are different types of powders. Or columns are different. The columns are different types of hoppers, and the rows are different types of powders. It's all explained in the paper. Green or red means that everything worked fine. It didn't have an arch or a rat hole. Red meant that you had flow problems, and this is without vibration. So they turn on the vibrators, and you can see that things actually got worse because you think that if you add some vibration, you're going to add some stress to the outlet, but you're also adding some internal stress so you can pack the material. So more often than not, vibration is, wor is worse. I put this on LinkedIn, and boy, I got some hate emails from the vibrator people. They said, hey, you got to put it in the right way. Maybe it's true, but I still like to have gravity to work. Very quickly, I'm going to talk about this solids discharge rates. If you know the geometry, you have a coarse material, it's fairly straightforward to calculate what the outlet size is. All you need to know is what the hopper angle is, what the outlet size is. M is equal to one for a cone, zero for a slot. And you can plug and chug into a simple equation to figure out what outlet size is required to get a desired discharge rate. But if you have a fine powder, then remember I told you you can get a negative pressure above the outlet. When that happens, then you start getting some gas flowing counter to the flow of the powder because you have vacuum. So what we do is we measure the permeability. Permeability is easier to measure. We just pass a gas through a column of material. We plot the pressure drop versus the flow rate and the slope of the lines related to the permeability. So very quickly here, you get an equation. The term K is the permeability. It looks rather complicated. It really isn't. It is a quadratic formula. And I will refer you to my website. You can look up the equations. I'm going really quick here. So to summarize, flow problems, arching, caking, segregation, flooding, erratic discharge, the flow properties, fundamental flow properties, cohesive strength, internal friction, compressibility, wall friction, permeability, and hopper design. You really want to know what the outlet dimension is to prevent a stable rat hole from forming or prevent an arch from developing. And if you want to have mass flow, you determine the hopper angle required to get flow along the walls. So one last story to tell. There is a famous study performed by a company called the Rand Corporation. A long time ago, they performed a study where they looked at different solids processing plants in North America, and they looked at different new plants that handle fluids as well. They had lots and lots of data. I'm going to show you the results from a while ago. They have another, they performed another study with similar conclusions, but I'm going to present some data from an old paper that they wrote. So shown here is the planned startup time versus actual startup time for new plants that handle liquids and gases versus solids. So this project engineer assigned the task of, of the startup of new plant that handle fluids. He wasn't too worried, he knew what he was doing, he knew how to calculate a Reynolds number, so I figured oh, I'll give myself three months for startup. Whereas the project engineer assigned the startup of a new plant that handled powders, through that at least one of the powders is schizophrenic, maybe better give myself six months. So shown here is plan versus actual. So the plant that expected startup time for a new plant that handled fluids, three months, the actual, four months, not too many surprises maybe a few leaks in the pump, whatever. Everybody's happy, everything was, everything started on time and then on budget. The project engineer got a big bonus that year. Well, you already know what the punchline is for the solids. The expected startup time was six months and it took close to two years. All these problems occurred. 80% of new plants handled that handled solids had problems. The average startup time was about 20 months versus four months for fluids. And my favorite bullet is the last one. Typical performance was 40 to 50% of design. So you know what the solution often was? They would find that they'd only get 4,000 pounds out of the plant and they, and they wanted 8,000. So you know what they'd do? They'd build a second line and have two crappy processes rather than one crappy process to be able to get the tons out that they needed. So please visit my website. I have a lot of good documents on powder flow, a few papers, short papers. I have a textbook there. You can go to www.meos.net. We're running close to the edge there, but I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Great, thank you so much, Greg, for that excellent talk. Um, we do have just one or, or two minutes for questions here. We had a couple come in offline, let's see. Um, I know we touched on this briefly, but um, maybe just explain again, you know, how does humidity affect powder discharging from a bin? 
you know, humidity. Yeah, actually, sometimes it's often easy to to predict because if you measure what's called the moisture isotherm, there is a condition where it really starts to pick up moisture. When it picks up moisture, then you got water accumulating at the contact points between the adjacent particles. And then you have extra cohesive forces besides the cohesive forces between particles, you have the cohesive forces between the water and the particles. So often what you want to do is you want to measure the properties of your powder under the conditions you're going to be operating. It's often a good idea if you anticipate high humidity, measure the properties under conditions that simulate high humidity. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we actually do have a couple more rolling in here. So how do you do the shear tests for a powder with hard agglomerations like pebbles? Well, if you have some of those large particle size, <clears throat> you generally need a larger shear cell tester. There's a rule of thumb about how big the particles you have to be to make sure you can shear it. What's nice about large particles as a rule is the larger the particles, the less cohesive it is. So chances are pretty good. You don't have to worry about the cohesive strength. You often have to worry about wall friction because then you have to worry about the uh, flow behavior. Okay, a second part to that question. I mean, how do you choose the consolidation stress for the shear test? What you want to do is you want to measure the properties over the range of stresses that you anticipate your powder um, having. So I, sh I explained the Janssen equation to you. So that tends to be a, an upper point because you're designing for funnel flow. You want to have data at that high pressure. So that's easy. You just plug everything into the Janssen equation. If you don't have the information, you just make an estimate. And that's going to tell you what the highest stress level you need to have for a data point. And then the lowest point, generally your shear cell tester has a lower limit. That tells you the lowest point, and then you just have a point in the middle. Generally, you'd like to have three points. With three points, you can regress your data, come up with a flow function. Excellent. Thank you. Can you elaborate a bit on the counterproductive use of vibration, and are air cannons counterproductive as well? Air cannons are better, but the problem again with vibration is sometimes they will actually compact the material. You have this internal stress as well. And if you recall, the cohesive strength depends on that internal stress. So if you add some stress inside, all you're doing is in increasing the cohesive strength. You're also increasing the bulk density, so sometimes that helps you. But more times than not, vibration can hurt you. The nice thing about air cannons, it's more of a shock wave. And they're often used if you want to reinitiate flow. So it'll temporarily start the flow, it'll stop again. And often you want to use air cannons when you have something that tends to flow rather regularly. And then sometimes materials will gain cohesive strength if you're shut down for a weekend, for example, and you want to start up again, you just give it one big shock wave, you go back to where you were, it's going to be flowing again. But air cannons are quite a bit better than vibrators. There's also something called a air slide. I can't remember who makes them, but you can do a Google of air slide and those are really effective. It's more of an, a tangential airflow Oh, thanks for that explanation, Greg. Someone wrote in, I believe you mentioned aspect ratio as an indication or lack thereof flowability. Can we learn anything from circularity or convexity of particles? You know, as a rule, the more, the, the odder the aspect ratio, the more cohesive it is. But I, what I always say is if you wanna know, just measure the properties. It's an easy test, it's a quick test. And whether it's a nice, round material that's cohesive because the forces between the particles are high or as forces are high just because you have a lot of contact area because of the aspect ratio put in the shear cell tester you'll measure the cohesive strength and then there's no guessing you'll be able to figure out what size hopper outlets required to prevent an instruction to flow from forming i see thank you um one last one i actually can answer someone was uh inquiring where can I send my powder to be tested for flowability. Um, Hariba has a fully equipped applications lab uh, and does testing and method development for anyone evaluating instruments. All you need to do is just reach out to us at labinfo at hariba.com um, and we're happy to answer any of your questions there. Yeah, I'm not sure if you answered his question. It sounds like he was 
<clears throat> Boy, my voice is gone. I think he was asking about how do you measure flowability, say the cohesive strength and all that stuff. You can go to my email. If you, if you send me an email, go to my website, I have my email address there. Actually, it's on my website as well. I can provide the test for you. Actually, what I do is I send my powder samples to a company called Solids Handling Technology. It was started by another former Jenneke and Johansson engineer, and I have a nice relationship with them because he gives me a big discount on my test fees, which I pass to my clients. And plus, he moves me up to the top of his queue because we work on a lot of projects together. And because I'm a sociopath, he doesn't want to piss me off. I'm joking there. But I can provide the t test for you. Just send me an email and we can come up with the scope of work and I'll be able to provide the test and also the analysis. I'll be able to come up with the hopper outlet dimensions, the ball friction, the um, hopper angles for mass flow if that's required. My website has a sample test report that I provide. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Greg, for that. Um, and with that, I actually think that we're at our time. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for attending want to remind you, please don't hesitate to reach out to us here at Hariba, labinfo at hariba.com for any questions you might have. Um, obviously, Greg is a great source of knowledge as well. Um, and you can see his contact information there on his website. Um, please just do uh, make sure that you join our newsletter or uh, just simply connect with us on LinkedIn at the Hariba Particle Characterization Group. And with that, again, just want to thank you, Greg. Uh, for an excellent talk, and um, we're looking forward to seeing everybody next time. Hopefully, right. my book return next time I talk. <laughs> I'm sure it will. Yeah. All right, thanks, everyone. Right. So long.